38 to 10 was the final score in week three when these two teams faced off out in the city of Angels. Los Angeles Chargers did lose by 28 points, but they're a much healthier team now. And so for this episode of Behind Enemy Lines, I'm bringing in my man Taron Rodriguez to break it all down so we know what the Jaguars are getting themselves into when they face off against the Los Angeles Chargers. What is going on, man? Hey, Jags fan cave. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, one of the bigger injuries that happened to this Los Angeles Chargers team was the loss of Rayshon Slater. Happened very early in the season. How is the, how have the Chargers dealt with that offensive line loss? Well, they've had their games where the offensive line has done good without Rayshon Slater, and then more often than not, they had times where they basically didn't do good. I mean, the previous game against the Denver Broncos, they actually did not allow a sack. I think they only allowed three pressures on the day, which is actually pretty good, considering the Chargers have not been fully healthy offensively since week one. So overall, the offensive line has had its issues. I know the Jags didn't get set or Trevor Lawrence didn't get sacked in the first meeting against the Chargers and that was the biggest issue and with the offensive line for both teams it's one of the keys for victory in this game Mm -hmm. 1000 percent you know another big piece that was missing in that first matchup between these two teams was the Chargers were out Keenan Allen you know Mike Williams was the number one target for Justin Herbert well it's looking like potentially that Mike Williams might be missing this game. It looks like the roles might flip. He did look like he had a pretty nasty injury. Obviously, you know, doctors have said it's not as bad as it looked uh, from the Denver game. What's the status on Mike Williams and his availability for this game on Saturday? So what I'm hearing is that he did he is not at practice today and he didn't practice yesterday. So he's going to have to get in some sort of like practice on Thursday. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, uh he'll probably go in with the designated questionable or doubtful tag. And it's a big loss, but for the Chargers, they do have other receivers. They have Joshua Palmer who stepped up when Mike Williams and Keenan Allen were out. And then they also have Deandre Carter. And also fun fact, the Chargers had six different receivers log 500 plus receiving yards, which I think is quite incredible. And those players were Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Joshua Palmer, DeAndre Carter, Keenan Allen, and Gerald Everett. Uh, I I was, I'm very surprised by that Gerald Everett. That's, that's a, the Jaguars have historically failed to cover tight ends. And the fact that you were bringing up a tight end that's been productive makes me a little bit nervous, but one of the biggest acquisitions that was made in the entire NFL offseason this year was the trade for pass rusher Khalil Mack you know now that the regular season's over if you had to put a letter grade on it you know what would you grade that trade for these Los Angeles Chargers I mean for the Khalil Mack trade I'd probably give it an A maybe A minus but I think an A would be significant just because Khalil Mack most people were saying oh well he doesn't have it in him he's not as young as he once was Mm -hmm. but it's like he's getting the dude's getting double teamed and God bless him. He's done this without a majority of Joey Bosa by his mm-hmm. side. So the fact that Khalil Mack has been effective most of the season is quite astounding. And I also have to give a little props to Kyle Van Noy on him coming in from free agency. He's actually stepped up as of late. So he's going to have to be key. I mean, Joey Bosa did pop up on the injury report but he was a full practice yesterday and I don't think his injury is as big as Mike Williams's is as Mike is the only one that was a d- did not practice yesterday got it you know we're going to keep it with the defense here the Chargers are coming into this game with a very good you know pass defense you look at all the big names that are on that secondary across the secondary seventh best in the league in passing yards allowed but then you look at that run defense and they're the first they're the fifth worst run defense in yards allowed in the National Football League. What what do you think the reason for this massive gap between those two is? So I know the Chargers cornerbacks are very good. Michael Davis has been significant ever since JC Jackson went down against Seattle. Asante Samuel Samuel Jr has been quite the surprise in his second year and Bryce Callahan was a great acquisition coming in from free agency from the Denver Broncos he even had a pick six which it's been a while since the Chargers have had a pick six but uh those corners are definitely good 
Now, Khalil Mack does do decent against the run, but it's only him. And that's my biggest concern considering Travis Etienne has been outstanding as of late. Like Mm -hmm. he has ever since James Robinson got traded, he has taken the leading running back role and ran with it. No pun intended. So the Chargers (laughs) are really going to have to slow him down because the difference between the Titans run defense and the Chargers run defense is that the Titans actually have a very good run defense and they knew Mm -hmm. what to expect from the Jaguars considering they faced him not too too long ago but they knew that Travis Etienne was going to be that guy that was going to run on him and if the Jaguars do get that run game going then it's going to open up the pass game and it's going to make things all bad for the Chargers so they got to limit Travis Etienne to the best of their ability. 100%. Now, my next question is kind of a two-parter. It's part on offense, part on defense. Every team in the league, you know, has those guys that are very, very good contributors on their team. But when you look at the rest of the league and their notoriety in the rest of the league, they're almost completely unknown. Who would you say are two players, uh, one on offense, one on defense, on this Chargers team that are heavily underrated when it comes to the national spotlight? That is a very good question. Um, Offensively, I kind of have to – I feel this is going to be an interesting answer, but I think Austin Eckler might be a little underrated just because Mm -hmm. he obviously didn't go to the big-time college. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he was undrafted, but he's made a name for himself, and he kind of got Pro Bowl snubbed, though that's kind of irrelevant in my (laughs) opinion. But uh, Austin Eckler, I think, is underrated, and I know he had a fumble in the game against Denver, but – and that's probably the indication that he's getting the bad game out of the way. And hopefully he doesn't have another bad game this week just because they can't afford it. And then for the chargers, I think Michael Davis is definitely underrated just because he was actually the lowest man on the depth chart when JC Jackson was active, hmm. but then JC Jackson went down. Michael Davis has been quite the ball Hawk mm-hmm. guarding some of the top receivers from the opposing teams. And I think that's big right there just because Davis, he struggled last year, and now he's quite significantly evolved into a underrated corner, in my opinion. 100%. You know, you've talked about the game last week against Denver a little bit in various parts of the video. Now, the Chargers' seed was completely locked in. You know, during the broadcast, they were talking about the matchup and the buildup between Trevor Lawrence versus Justin Herbert. You know, this great matchup of two great young quarterbacks. Why was did Braylon did Brandon Staley give any explanation why Mike Williams was playing, why Herbert was playing, why all of these stars were playing when and quite rea- and literally there was nothing to play for. There was no benefit to them playing. Yeah, he gave the weirdest explanation saying he can't manage that and he only has like 53 guys to choose from. I didn't understand. Now, from what I've seen, like mathematically speaking, teams that have played their starters in the final week in of the NFL season have gone on to win their playoff games 71% of the time. Whereas player teams that rest their starters in the final week and then play a playoff game, Mm -hmm. go on to win their game only 33% of the time. Mm -hmm. Now those are just numbers and statistics and figures, but I understand why you don't want to lose the momentum and you don't want to lose your ebb and flow and the cohesion from your offensive and Mm -hmm. defensive guys. However, you don't want to leave them in for as long as you can. I think what Staley should have done was put him in just one quarter, maybe a quarter and a half, and then start taking them out for the second and third stringers. So losing Mike Williams is crucial. And there are like Staley has done some questionable things and there are some like reports and rumors and the so-called experts saying that if Staley loses or if the chargers lose, then Staley needs to be fired. And It's considering the Chargers have been through so much injury and turmoil and they were six and six after the Raiders lost, then went on to win four straight and lock up a playoff seed. I kind of find that a little hard to do Mm -hmm. just because Staley does deserve credit. I mean, don't get me wrong. There was actually a Jags Jaguars fan who basically uh, told me, and I quote, you should be hoping that the Chargers lose so they could fire that baby boy and I don't think he knew the uh, (laughs) name of our head coach but he said then they can go out and get Sean Payton or Jim Harbaugh and I'm like okay well I mean the problem with the Chargers is is that they're too cheap they don't like to go after the big names Mm -hmm. but 
that's just it is what it is. I mean, I'll give also reflect this. Coaching does matter, and Doug Peterson has done really good wonders for the Jaguars. And I could see him or Brian Dable of the Giants being mm. coach of the year. That is music to Jaguar fans' ears. I've been beating that drum for the past couple of weeks now, and it's really starting to get that national attention with Tony Dungy actually coming out and saying he should be coach of the year, Doug Peterson. Now, one of my final questions here is is, is kind of an open-ended question. If the Chargers win, what will be the reason why they win? It would probably be because they got pressure on Trevor Lawrence. They mm-hmm. forced him to make errors and whatnot. They were ready for the run de- run game. It was just going to have to be based on defense. I mean, we go back to the week where the Chargers played the Dolphins, which was, I think it was like week 13. Mm-hmm when they played on national TV, everyone was picking the dolphins just because chargers defense is not good. The fact that Derwin James, Khalil Mack, Kyle Van Noy, and all those other defensive players Mm -hmm. didn't know, by the way, actually, no, there was no, no Derwin James and there was no Joey Bosa at the time. So the fact that all those players, all the defense basically stepped up without all those top players defensively is a, basically turning point and I think that Raiders loss kind of woke them up saying we're much better than this so the Chargers are really going to have to clamp down defensively and they're going to have to score points I mean Mm -hmm. back in week 17 when the Chargers played the Rams they actually scored a third quarter touchdown which was the first third quarter touchdown since week five when the Chargers played the Browns so when I saw that touchdown of Gerald Everett it felt like a breath of fresh air. So <laughs> overall, it was pretty fun to see the Chargers get that little score. And they have, they've they gotten their bad game out of the way defensively. Obviously, giving up 31 points, which is the most that Denver has scored all season, was unacceptable, even with starters. But they've got the bad game out of the way. Hopefully, for my sake, they, get, they don't have that happen again. And here's my thing and this is no offense to jaguar the jaguars they've done so great but for me considering the chargers have been through a lot i would like nothing more than to just see them get to the divisional round it's not going to be easy just because jaguars chargers is probably the most 50 50 matchup of all the super wild card weekend games so i think it's going to be a battle justin herbert's just going to have to be patient when it comes to throwing the ball and getting his targets And they got to utilize the run game more. Austin Eckler only had four carries in the first meeting. And Mike Williams only had one catch in that first meeting. So the Chargers have to use all their offensive options to the best of their ability. And I understand Jacksonville stepped up and Rayshon Jenkins, the former Charger, is big time. But overall, it's going to they have to basically leave it out on the field just because Mm -hmm. it's win or go home time. And it is going to be tough playing in Jacksonville. But I really think the Chargers are up for the test. But it's not this, no matter who wins or who loses, this isn't going to take away from the amazing season that either team had. I mean, Jacksonville Mm -hmm. has proved they're back, and I knew they were going to be improved. I didn't think they would win the division. No offense, of course. But I thought it was going to be the Titans again, maybe the Colts, but the Mm -hmm. Titans went in free fall mode, and the Colts obviously became a big mess. So for Jacksonville, This is only the beginning for them, regardless of what happens this weekend and in the playoffs. Yeah, this is definitely a lot of Jacksonville media locally is talking about how this is the Peyton Manning era of the AFC South, except it is no longer Indianapolis that runs it. It's going to run through Jacksonville. Jacksonville has a leg up on the entire division. They're the only team that has a stable head coaching position. Who knows what's going to happen with Mike Vrabel if Malik Willis doesn't work out because they're picking 11th. Do they go Will Levis? Do they go Anthony Richardson? I don't know. But the fact that they are probably the only stable franchise in the division, it's just setting up for a decade of dominance from Duval County to the rest of the league. Now, final question of the video. It's a very simple one. Score prediction, who wins the game? Uh, Like I said, this one is completely Mm 50-50. I hate to do this to all of the Jaguars fans, and forgive me for this, but I have to go tradition, and I have to go Chargers winning. Let's go 31-24. I think that's a respectable score. I don't think the Chargers are going to – they're going to limit the Jaguars' offense, but 
obviously Trevor Lawrence is going to get his. Travis Etienne mm-hmm. is going to get his. Evan Ingram has just flourished into this amazing tight end. And then Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, and all those other wide receivers have really come into their own ever since coming to Jacksonville. And I, I like how the Jaguars, side note, Jaguars really let the one guy that said the Jaguars signed all those guys, and then he bashed them for it. So <laughs> how's that How's that a hot take working out for you? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Don't let your hot takes come from anyone from Duval County. We have suffered through so much. Your little joke will not hurt us, but we will find a way to hurt you. That has definitely been a staple of Jaguar fans, especially on Twitter as of late. Now, don't worry, you aren't the first guy to pick your team to win the game, but of course – I have never picked against these Jaguars. I do think the Jaguars win. I do think it's a very, very close game. I do have a score of 27-24. You know, I I compare this game a lot to the Ravens game. It's going to be a back and forth, just slugfest of two offenses that are going at it. It's going to be a who can win the turnover battle. And it might turn into a game of who just has the ball last. So the Jaguars have actually been, the Jaguars have been in a ton of just literally just bare knuckle street fights with the Cowboys, with the Ravens. And I think this is just another one of those games with an offense that is very, very high powered. I think it's going to be a great game. I'm excited to be there and it's just, it's going to be a slug fest. I'm very, very excited for it, but I do want to wrap the video up with this. Where can Jaguar fans find you if they want to tell you how great your analysis was and why the Jaguars are going to win? You can find me on Twitter at Taren Rodriguez one. It's T E R A N then Rodriguez with the G in it. And then the number one. So best of Mm -hmm. luck to the Jaguars. Again, it's so amazing to see that they came into their own and how they've, how Doug Peterson's just turned that team around and it's, it's just an amazing thing. And someone had to win the AFC South. And fortunately the Jaguars rose to the occasion and they knocked off the big bully off its perch. 100%. Thank you, man. So much for coming on. Stay safe. Go Jaguars on to the divisional round. One of us will go. Thanks again. Hey, thanks man. How about them Jags? Come on, Joe.